to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, beginning at verse 12. Uh, we decided today to go back and read the previous 10 verses, uh, which we've studied through for several weeks, looking, looking at the delineation of the charismata, of the grace gifts. And it seemed good to have that in our, in our uh, frame as we take up again the idea that we are the body of Christ. Uh, the church, the local church, this visible expression of the church on earth is the body of Christ. We have one head. He is Jesus. He is Lord. He's Lord over the church. If we know him, if we're followers of Jesus Christ, he is Lord over our lives. And if he is not Lord over our lives, then we have no biblical ground to have confidence that we have been saved by him. So I want us to, to see today. I'm going to ask you to stand with me if you would. I'm going to read verses 12 to 31. You feel free to follow along in your Bibles. We also have the text on the screen for you. Hear what the Apostle Paul has to say. He's not moved away from the discussion of the charismata, of the grace gifts, which were being abused and neglected somewhat in, in Corinth. So hear this in the light of what we just read earlier. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would, the sense of, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may no, be no division in the body but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Remember I told you last week that you read that, and we'll look at this shortly. The way the question is posed in the Greek is, all do not possess gifts of healing, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? And then verse 31, but earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And may the Lord help us. I, my prayer is that when we look at passages like this, that some things would happen to us mentally, that I, that I, I start thinking gospel thoughts, thinking about something like this as the gospel wants me to. Not as, my, not as my flesh wants me to, not as our culture would like for me to, but as the Scripture, that Scripture would inform and shape and transform my thoughts on this. And then there would be a, the tangible evidence 
that I've embraced what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, we told you last week that in those, uh, those verses, particularly verses 4 to 11, that we spent several weeks on, emphasizing the great diversity of gifts bestowed by the Spirit on the people of God, that continuing that theme at a, at a, at a less obvious level, this passage uses an analogy of the many parts that make up the human body, stressing that this diversity of the many parts contributes to the essential oneness of the church. The church is not an inorganic institution. It is an organic reality. It has a heartbeat for Jesus. We're not looking like cults do for uniformity. But the scripture calls us to press hard for unity in the midst of our diversity. I would remind you that Paul says in Ephesians 2, in verses 8, 9, and 10, that passage that many of us have memorized, for by grace you're saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. That he goes on and says, for we are his workmanship, and I've told you before, we, we went through Ephesians and we pointed this out. The word workmanship is poema. You could, you could transliterate that poema. We are his poem. We are, we are his trophy. Uh, we are his masterpiece. We, we constitute today, those of us here who know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we constitute a, an anthology of poems of the grace of God. There's a common thread that runs through every story here of those who know Christ. We were lost. We've been found. My friend R.F. Gates used to talk about how you, sh a great way to remember how to share your testimony. Then, what I was. When, when I encountered Jesus. Now, the change has taken place. All of us have that common story. We were once lost. And through various means, we were encountered with the gospel. Maybe, maybe a mom sitting on the knee of our mother as just small children, her singing about Jesus' love, her reading the scripture. Maybe it was a Sunday school teacher. Maybe a pastor. Maybe a friend. Some event, some Christian event. And you were, you were encountered by the gospel and subdued and wooed by the grace of God. Your story would be different from everybody else's story. No two people here today were saved in the same uh, path, but salvation is the same for all of us. There's no one here more saved or less saved. And so this emphasis of, of, the, of the many parts of the body, the diversity that we, we demonstrate today, and yet this unity of a common thread of the gospel. And by the way, that whatever our background be, whatever our preferences be, whatever our tastes be, wherever we were raised, this common experience of grace that those of us who are Christ followers share together ought to overrule and overwhelm and throw into the shadows any other difference we might have. And if it doesn't, it casts aspersion on the mighty grace of God, the amazing grace of God we just sang about. And so, so we have this passage here that's so rich. And last week we looked, uh, well, I'll give you the five-point outline. Last week we, we looked, first of all, at like the human body, the church is one, verses 12 and 13. Second, like the human body, the church is made up of many members. We looked at that as well, verses 14 to 20. Today we're going to pick up these last three. Like the human body, the members of church are, are mutually dependent. Then like the human body, the members are to feel with and for one another. And finally, every believer is a part of the body of Christ, and no one is self-sufficient. So let's look at, pick up with number three today. Like the human body, the members of the church are mutually dependent. Notice what he says in verses 21 to 24. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. I mean, on, on the surface, that is ludicrous. An eye cannot feed the body. An eye cannot open the door. There are 
thousands of things an eye cannot do that a hand can do. Nor, again, the head to the feet. I have no need of you. Silly. Sure, we have need of our feet. Sure, we have need of the capacity to move. And you can, ha you can be the smartest person in the world, but, but all your brilliance will not move you one particle of an inch without your feet. And so he's using this, this what we would say, very drastic analogy. And he goes on and says, on the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. It's interesting that he would use that in, in, that, in that culture. He's drawing upon the idea that, that seeing, that thinking was considered superlative. And what you pick up what he's doing. He is, he is thinking in terms of class structure. In Paul's day, the hands, the feet were focused on manual labor. The eye would be taking an intrinsic beauty. The head, thought, philosophy. And so that's how he's using this here. We don't think in those terms, but that's, that's what he's saying. They're indispensable. Parts of the body we don't think about. You don't think about your gallbladder until you double over in pain and think, something's wrong here. There's lots of, lots of internal organs that you, that, you know, I, I promise you, you didn't get up this morning and go, I wonder how my gallbladder's doing. Start poking around. You, didn't, you, don't, you don't do that. Now, we know we can live without a gallbladder, but you know something? You know my definition of minor surgery and major surgery? Major surgery is cutting on me. You cut on me, that's major. God put these in the body for a reason. We, we, don't, we don't think about it. We treat them as if they're less important. It's amazing. We can, we can live without a kidney under certain circumstances. We don't, we don't have to have both, but I promise you life's a whole lot easier if you have both functioning. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And I'm not going to get, uh, get graphic here, but you can use your imagination. We cover ourselves. These unpresentable parts of Scripture thinks in terms of modesty and immodesty. Don't let people, I don't know if you've ever encountered some of these people, but I have. They say, well, in the beginning, God didn't put clothes on Adam and Eve. So apparently that's the way he wanted it. That's, that's, that's ridiculous. If, if that thought even held any weight at all, Paul would be wasting his time talking this way. The unpresentable parts, treated with greater modesty, and yet vital. Unpresentable parts, uh, necessary for, for procreation, for the advancing uh, of, of life. He says our presentable parts do not require. And so Paul has done, he's really turned conventional thinking on its head. And said, if you're in the body of Christ, here's how you need to learn to think. There are people among us right now, I, I don't have any doubt in my mind, who think, well, gee, I'm not important. That is a devil's lie. You are very important. You minister in ways, as I said last week, I don't think people take seriously their ministry of presence, not, not with a T on the end, but presence of being there. The encouragement you are. Serving behind the scenes, praying. There are prayer warriors sitting in this room right now that some of you will never know about until we get to heaven. And it will be revealed. These people were laying hold of the throne of mercy grabbing the horns of the altar in intercession. The folks out front, high profile, 
I'm not, I'm not under the delusion. Folks, I know that the only way I'm sustained, teaching, preaching, ministering, is by, by your intercessions. Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon said, he said, I have this fear that I would stand to preach the gospel and no one has prayed for me. Intercession, which is done in secret, done behind closed doors, powerfully moves heaven. And so Paul is making this argument here. But God has so composed the body, giving honor to the part that lacked it. So that's the first thing we need to recognize in this, in this part of the study today. We are mutually dependent. I pray that I never act like I don't need you. We need God every hour, and we need one another. We truly do. Never let the devil convince you you don't need so-and-so. We do. We're a body. If we were individuals, disconnected, a lone wolf, so to, so to speak, uh, but we're not. We're an organic reality placed here, not accidentally. God does this on purpose. His providence has us where he has us. We need to consider that and think, think that like the body. Fourth, like the human body, the members are to feel with and for one another. Look at verse 25 and 26. He says, now, the, God has done this, right, in order that, verse 25 is a purpose clause, in order that there may be no division in the body. If you're thinking right, it discourages uh, schism. It discourages party spirit. Paul part, started out this letter addressing party spirit. That there may be no division in the body, but rather, say, there's, that there wouldn't be this, but there would be this. God has structured the, the local church in such a way. But that the members may have the same care for one another. You see, if we recognize how God values, then we value one another equally. I hope you get that. I hope you believe that. In the sight of heaven, by grace through faith, God does not value one Christian here more than he values another, and neither should we. We all, because we're part of his anthology, bring to the life of the church something that if we were not, then we'd be missing. We would, we would be uh, diminished. Then he says, if one member suffers, all suffer together. I've observed through the years of fairly consistent, and I'm not, I don't want to brag, but I'm just thanking God today, that this, this congregation is made up of folks who, who bear one another's burdens who suffer with, who get under the load. We talked about that in Galatians. Remember in Galatians, Paul says, each one should bear his own burden. And it's, the, it's the Greek word that would be the daily knapsack of the soldier. That, you know, we live in a day where everybody's wanting everybody else to do something for them. It's, that's not the Scripture's way. We each carry our own daily concerns. But then he says that each one bear his own burden. Each one bear one another's burdens. And he uses a different word there. It's the word for heavy load. So the tension in the Christian life is that I need to be responsible to, to embrace God's providences daily and bear those things. By the same token, I need to be looking to get under the load of other people and help them. That's the, that's the gospel way. That's what the gospel does. And so if, if one member suffers, all suffer together. We pray together, a prayer meeting every Wednesday night. We go through a list of different things. We go through the countries around the world. 
And then we talk about our, our members and the things we know about. And Pat, I want to just say we appreciate so much you keeping updates coming to us about Zarek. That's, that's so meaningful. It helps us to pray intelligently for him. And so we do that. It's the only time we spend an extended time doing that. It's a time when we can get under the load. We can, we can be apprised of struggles and we can be updated and we can cry out together where two or more gathered in my name. There I am in the midst of you. Don't devalue midweek prayer. It's, it's an opportunity to do exactly what's talked about here. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. That's a wonderful thing. I'm, I know of, of a situation that doesn't exist anymore where members of a church told me they were afraid. Listen to this now. They were afraid to share with their, with their friends in the church that maybe they'd gotten new furniture or something because they did not want to be looked down on by the church or by their leadership. That is awful. That is cultic. We ought to rejoice when others rejoice. We ought to thank God when God blesses. You know what the devil wants you to do? He wants you to be jealous. I actually had someone say to me years ago, way long time ago before I was here, talking about someone else, well, it must be nice to be able to afford a good car. I thought, why can't you just rejoice with those who rejoice? You see, the, the spirit of the Christian is, he weeps with brothers and sisters when they weep. And he rejoices when they rejoice. And see, what happens is, check this out, the unfeelingness of some when some weep. I don't, I don't even know who you're talking about. That's a crime if that's happening in a local church. That's a crime. And then something good happens. Huh. Why them? Why not me? That is not reflective of the Spirit of Christ. And Paul addresses that here. We're to feel with and feel for. Blessed be the tie that binds our heart in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. We bear our mutual woes, our mutual burdens there. And often for each other flows a sympathizing tear. Now, brothers and sisters, if that's not in you, I love you. But you need, to, you need to get along with God and pray. Dear God, warm my heart. If something is crusted over so I don't know how to grieve with those who grieve, then I don't know how to, to bear up those who are suffering. God, break through that crust. And make that, that fleshy heart that you put in there in the new covenant when you, when you saved me by grace through faith and gave me a new heart, gave me in the, in the new birth, make that beat fresh again. Because I'm going to tell you something. If you're not careful, if you're not intentionally doing that, life will crust you over. It'll crust you over. Just let one, two, three, four, five, six, seven eight people betray you. And you'll go into survival mode. And we don't do our best ministry in survival mode. And we don't function as the body in that mode. No division. Division harms the body. But the opposite, care for one another nurtures the body. It's edification, it's building one another up in love. And so fifth, every believer is a part of the body of Christ. All right, so that's the first part of this equation. If you're saved by grace through faith, and you say, man, I don't, I don't feel like I belong here. We repent. I don't want anybody within the sound of my voice who's a part of the membership at Bethel to feel like you don't belong. So let me ask you this. Do you long to be? Because that's the old English meaning of the word belong. Do you long to be?
and then get honest. And here's, here's how I would suggest you do it. Because a couple, you know, you can say, well, I just get the feeling nobody cares for me here. That, we can receive that. Why not, why not say it in an edifying way? Pray for me. I'm really, I'm really being drawn away by the enemy of our souls who's, who's lying to me, telling me that, that my church family wouldn't care one way or another if I wasn't here anymore. Share that. Tell somebody that so they can pray for you and encourage you and assure you that that is not true. And then we can provoke one another to love and do good works and do a better job of demonstrating that. Now, let me say what this is not. What this is not is the me generation. Well, well, what's in it for me? What about me? You won't find that. That pronoun doesn't hardly even show up in the New Testament. What shows up in the New Testament is others. Think more highly of others. Love one another, care for one another, serve one another. So, so it's not, it's not feeding this, this generation that is so self-absorbed, so self-consumed. That's not what I'm advocating here. That's, that's the exact opposite of deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. But if, if the enemy of your soul is, is whispering to you and lying to you, about your place in this body, then let's, let's take this word here at its face value and put that lie to death. You are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So the, the beauty, the body, you don't lose your individualism. You bring that, which is undergoing sanctification, to the process of building up the body. And then Paul does something that's just staggering here. He's, we read the passage earlier about the gifts. Verse 28, and God has appointed in the church, he numbers, he gives a numeric priority, not superiority, a numeric priority in the gifts. Because remember, Corinth was abusing what we would call the remarkable gifts. And God has appointed in the church, first, apostles. Sounds, by the way, like Ephesians 4 when it does this. Second, prophets. Third, teachers. Then he stops the numeric system. Then miracles. Then gifts of healing. These things would have played really big in Corinth. These have been the headliners. These guys, you see, you know, you see them advertised every now and then. Somebody's coming in, they're going to have a big healing conference. Why not have a big gospel preaching conference? <laughs> I'll tell you why. Preaching the gospel doesn't draw a crowd today. Administrating various kinds of tongues. He hasn't done a comprehensive list here, but what he has done is he has highlighted three uh, teaching or speaking gifts, as they would be called. And he's put the one that was being abused in Corinth. And he said, well, how do you know this, Pastor? Because we're going to get to chapter 14. That's how I know it. <laughs> and he puts that one at the bottom. And then he asked these questions. And I'm going to ask them here the way that you would read them from the, from the text, the Greek text of 1 Corinthians. All are not apostles, are they? Now, he listed that first. The answer expected in that question is no. All are not prophets, are they? No. All are not teachers, are they? No. All don't work miracles, do they? No. All don't possess gifts of healing, do they? No. All don't speak with tongues, do they? No. All don't interpret, do they? That's how he's asking. He's expecting a no answer every 
time he asks these questions. We won't take a whole lot of time to go over, just, just to re remind you, the, the gift of apostle was a, was a temporary gift attached to one's uh, visible, physical encounter with Jesus. He, he called the 12 apostles. The word apostolos in the Greek means sent one. I told you that what I believe happens is there are things when the scripture is completed that, that these, these gifts uh, morph, if you please. And our, our friends that we prayed for in Southeast Asia earlier, they are apostoloi. They were sent there. Not with authority so that we would call them apostles, so-and-so and apostles, so-and-so, but with, a, with ministry under the authority of the Holy Spirit. There were 12 apostles. Paul was, as he said, one born out of due season on the road to Damascus. When the scripture came into its completion, and we're going to see that in 1 Corinthians 13, by the way, then that gift of apostleship in that expression ceased. We're going to see tonight in 2 Corinthians where Paul has to defend his apostleship, his authority to speak under divine inspiration from the folks in Corinth because some people came in and, and, and tried to undermine his ministry. All right, so apostleship. Prophets, those who spoke under immediate inspiration of the Spirit. Again, necessary sign gifts. We talked about those. But when the Scripture is complete, this is how God speaks. He has spoken in His Word. And the Scripture is coming to completion. And so, so prophet has, has morphed to where, the, where the, the forecasting part of it, the foretelling part of it, has, has, uh, has disappeared, and the forth telling, uh, the, the, the preaching proclamation continues. And then the teachers, uh, the didaskaloi, those who, those who labored in the church uh, communicating. We're not going to go through the gifts again. We did this several weeks ago for some time, but you get the picture here that that continues the taking of the scriptures and demonstrating the capacity both from, from serious engagement and the illumination of the Spirit in your life to communicate biblical truth. The teachers. And then we talked about the miracles and the, and the gifts of healing and, and the helps, which, by the way, I've said, I believe, I believe the ministry of helps, the gift of helps, moves a congregation. If it's true, if it's true that an army uh, travels on the energy it receives from eating, then the church, the church advances in those who embrace the charismata of helping. You cannot truly care for somebody if you're not helping. How can I help? What can I do? You see, you cannot pray long for someone without being moved by the Lord to, to in, enter their plight. Administrating, those who have gifts to, to organize. We've got some tremendous administrative types here who, who bring to the table uh, a giftedness. It's a, it's a skill set that's been, if I can say, been baptized in the Spirit and is very useful for the ministry of the church. Uh, and so, so you have these, this list here. And I want to show you something now. I want you to look with me. Go back. Verse 30. All don't speak with tongues, do they? All don't interpret do they look with me at verse 13 chapter 12 in verse 12 for just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body though many are one body so it is with Christ verse 13 it's critical that you understand verse 13 in the light of verse 30 or that you understand verse 30 in the light of verse 13, in the same chapter of the same letter. For we were all baptized into one body.
Now, if they're members of the local church at Corinth, uh, then they experienced immersion. That was the sign. Dead to sin, raised in a newness of life. So you've experienced in your life spiritual death, spiritual resurrection to go on the spiritual journey. Keep on reading. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. Brothers and sisters, he's not just talking about water baptism there. He's talking about spirit baptism. Get the image here for Paul. We were all immersed and we all consumed, made to drink. All. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior here today, whether you were saved 60, 70 years ago, whether you were saved six months ago, you experienced this. You've been baptized in the Spirit. Well, what is baptism in the Spirit? You know what it's not? According to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 30, if you were all baptized and all don't speak in tongues, then it cannot be the manifestation of tongues. It's an exegetical impossibility, first, because of the text. And it becomes a theological impossibility because of what Paul is teaching here. Baptism in the Spirit is that initial encounter of the new birth. The new birth is symbolized. Born again, born from above. It's symbolized when we take someone. It doesn't happen up there. If the new birth happens up there in that baptistry, then I have been derelict as a pastor. New birth is supposed to happen before anybody ever gets into that baptistry. All right? But that, that baptism experience symbolizes that a person has been born again. They died to who they were. They've been raised to walk in a newness of life. And Paul doesn't finish there because, see, the new birth also means that, that you, you now drink in the Spirit. Baptism in the Spirit is a one-time reality focused in the new birth. The continual infilling of the Spirit Ephesians 5, stop being drunk with wine, keep on being filled with the Spirit, not telling us there how that looks, or I mean, what, what, how, well, how you do that, telling us what it looks like, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. The filling of the Spirit provokes you to sing, singing and making merry in your heart to the Lord. You don't feel like singing. Now, look, I, don't, I know people, some people are shy about singing, so I'm not, I'm, not, I'm talking about people who, who normally would sing, filling of the Spirit provokes that. Singing and making merry in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks to God always for all, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. He tells us what being filled with the Spirit looks like. It's a continual reality. But baptism in the Spirit is a one-time reality of, uh, of, of the new birth. Paul says so here in 1 Corinthians 12. And then he says this, verse 31, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. It's interesting that he uses that term. He's given us a numeric order. Earnestly desire the higher gifts, the more tangible gifts. He's, ch he's chiding Corinth because that's not what they were doing there. That was being discounted there. In fact, so much so that in the next letter, 2 Corinthians, we're going to look through tonight, Paul has to say, what do, you, what do you mean you want to look at my credentials? What do you mean you need letters of commendation to, to receive me? They were devaluing that, that, that teaching ministry. Earnestly desire. And then he says, and I will show you a still more excellent way. How do you address the problem in Corinth? How do you address the problem in any church? Well, it's not to go to the judge. 1 Corinthians 6 <laughs> says don't do that. It's love. It's love. And you're going to see in 1 Corinthians 13, God willing, that love is not primarily a feeling. Love is an action. 
that flows out of a commitment. God so loved the world that he pitied the... No, no, no. God so loved the world that he gave. So I want to challenge you to read through 1 Corinthians 13 as if we're going to study it together here, not as if you're hearing it at a wedding. It was a great thing to read at a wedding. It was written to a church that was really messing up on the charismata. So read that. You're the body. You are the body of Christ. And each one of you, a valuable, meaningful member of this church. And if you know of somebody who is drifting away because the devil's gotten in their ear and says, you don't mean anything, then reach out to them, love them, assure them, pray for them. Because we, as the body of Christ, need every member. I told you last week, you know people that th think they're Christians but don't like church? Sit down with them sometime and say, okay, I want to challenge you to do something here. Take your little finger, cut it off, put it over there on the end table. I'll come back in a couple of weeks, we'll talk about it. If you can stand the stench and the, the decaying effect. Because that's what happens to people who think they can be part of the body and yet cut away from the body. Destroys the analogy. You are the body of Christ. Embrace it. Thank God he's placed you in it. Pray to him, Lord, show me, cultivate in me the charismata that's there that was placed in there in the new birth and strengthen me to do all for your glory and for the common good of the body of Christ to advance the gospel. Some here are not a part of the body of Christ because you've not yet confessed Christ as Lord and Savior. And my prayer is that you would, that you would, that you'd see him crucified and risen, willing and able to save you now if you will cry out to him in repentance for your sin and make a faith commitment to him to be the Lord of your life. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we bow before you to, in Jesus' name. What a brilliant, what a brilliant idea. What a brilliant analogy, the body. Oh, Lord, help us to value every member of this body, to not devalue any, not diminish any. And I pray for, for anyone here today who is struggling, thinking, I'd, well, I don't matter. Oh, God, drive that lie of Satan as far from the east and the west. Cast it back into the pit of hell where it came from. And by your spirit, encourage all, mutually encouraging, that if this church is to be what you have called a church to be, then we must accept and embrace that we are part of the body of Christ here. And then make us, Lord, a mighty, powerful unit to advance your gospel and bring you glory. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.